Good morning. How is everyone? Can I get a thumbs up? Can I get a yay? Um, we're going into what will be our last sessions of the day. And I am really excited to um, be up here with our panel today to bring you the discussion around talking about the tough stuff. So my name is Lisa Cruz and I am the patient advocacy lead at Takeda Oncology. I focus on non-small cell lung cancer, but I have also lost someone very close to me um, from lung cancer. So when we were working with the ALK Positive group to see how we could make a meaningful contribution to this year's summit, we worked with them to do a little bit of patient research and care partner and healthcare pro provider research around what happens outside of the medical setting. Once you've had the conversations with your physicians, how do you transition that conversation from the clinic to your community and start to have really difficult conversations with children, loved ones, neighbors, to start to build the support that you'll need to um, travel throughout your journey. So we worked with this um, panel as well as six other additional um, people to interview to get a better understanding of what that looks like. And I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves today, and then we'll go into the conversation. All right. I'm Brittany Wilson, as most of you know. Um, I am the care partner for Dan. He was diagnosed four and a half years ago, and we have two girls, Francesca, who we call Frankie, who is nine, and Georgia, who is six, and I'm a teacher. <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Summer Farman from Hershey, Pennsylvania. Um, I just had my three year anniversary living with stage four lung cancer. <laughs> I am a wife and mother to three children, Jackson, who is 22, Lucy, who's 20, we took a little break and have Harrison, who's 13. And I uh, am also in education, special education, and I do developmental evaluations for babies. Hi, everyone. Okay. <laughs> I'm Amanda Bilak Stewart, and I am 37 years old, and I have, I was diagnosed in October of last year, um, 10 days postpartum after giving birth to my twin boys. I have a husband and a stepson, and we live in Los Angeles, and I'm a realtor. Hello, everyone. My name is Sylvie Saxena. I am a social worker by trade. I currently work for a national hospice organization called Accent Care in their learning and development department, and I'm very grateful to be here with you all today. Hello, my name is Megan Roy. I am an oncology nurse navigator. I work with the lung cancer population at Penn Medicine. Um, I've been doing this for about eight years. I have four boys at home. Excellent. Thank you everyone for taking time to be here with us today. So as I mentioned today, we'll talk about a few broad topics. Um, we're going to start by the panelists sharing a little bit about sharing the story of your diagnosis. In summer, when we went through our interview process, you noted that you felt like you wanted to control the narrative surrounding who to tell, what to tell, how to tell um, around your diagnosis. Can you explain or talk about why that was important to you? Yes, yeah, so um, having a traumatic healthcare experience um, happened to us uh, in 2000 when my oldest was born. He was a twin actually born four months premature. He has severe special needs. He has a wheelchair and it's nonverbal, but understands everything. So this was not our first go around. Um, and I remembered back then, um, be before Facebook was around, that there were a lot of rumors and misconceptions and I did not like it then. Um, and definitely I knew with this diagnosis that I did want to exactly what you're saying, control the narrative. It was my story to tell. Um, so of course, right out of the gate, that wasn't my mindset um, that I wanted to share it. But as it all sank in, I knew that I wanted to be the one to tell it. Um, I'm not a huge social media poster, but that was the avenue that I took. Um, I 
and it was maybe six weeks after as I took my first dose of my TKI, I posted a picture of me with it and told the story about my diagnosis, um, thanking my community, um, explaining a little bit about what ALK was. Um, I shared that I wanted to be just like my son um, and that he was just a boy fighting all these challenges. I too wanted to be just a girl. So I put that out there. Um, and then my dad also was in charge of sending mass emails, um, but I did make sure that I proofread them first. And <laughs> again, I wanted that control of the narrative. There's so little you can control when, you know, given a stage four diagnosis, um, that that was me kind of taking control of what I wanted to share um, and who I wanted to share it with. So the emails went to colleagues and family and people who might not have social media. Thank you for sharing that. Amanda, who I just have to make a, a little note here. I mean, this is Amanda's first conference. So I'm so happy that you're able to join us in her first time participating in a panel, sharing her story. So I just wanted to commend you for being so brave. Um, <laughs> So you told us in your interview that so many people were asking for updates. Um, it made you feel a little bit overwhelmed and that you decided to keep information going forward on a need to know basis. Can you just tell a little bit about how you came to that decision? It, yes, um, it was really difficult at the beginning. I mean, as so many of you know in the audience, like when, you're, when you first get this diagnosis, it's just, you know, a bombardment of what's going on, tell me everything. And, you know, both fortunately and unfortunately, you have so many people that care about you so that you're repeating the same story over and over and over again. And it just became really difficult to do that. Um, both for me and my husband, my parents, I'm sure. Uh, my friends were doing it with the extended friends. So what I did was I just created a WhatsApp group and put the news in there. And I was in just left it for you know, if anyone wanted to know the update of the day, that was where it was. Um, at the beginning, there was a lot to share. There was a lot of updates at the beginning. It was, I was diagnosed. Now I'm meeting with the oncologist. This is what the PET scan says. This is what the MRI said. This is the medicine they're putting me on. So there was a lot to share. Now it's really turned into more of a, um, it's really just become like a Amanda's journey of life type of thing as I'm like, look, I got married and here's all of our pictures. And I'm really open with the link to the WhatsApp group. So anyone, anyone can join it. I don't care if we're really close or if we're not really close. I have on there, I have uh, my ex-boyfriend's aunt is one of the people because she lives in Israel and she heard about this. So, you know, I have her on there and then, you know, my husband and my best friend are both moderators on there also. So um, yeah, it's been really helpful to keep it all uh, in one place, not have you, to repeat it. Do you feel like you get a sense of support from it as well or is it more just a mechanism of sharing? Um, I. It, it, oh, it's a, it's totally a mechanism of support. It's, I mean, it's become an Amanda's rah-rah group. Like anything that I, and, and, and just one example of something so amazing was really at the beginning, people kept saying to you and everyone, everyone knows this of what can we do for you? And, you know, at first there really isn't anything, but then we really, I was supposed to breastfeed the twins. And then all of a sudden I just had to switch to formula really fast. I made a very fast pivot and then the formula was really expensive. And so that, that group uh, did basically did a call of action within their own networks also. And to this day, we still have formula and the babies are nine months old because of everyone that was able to help us. It's a really amazing outcome. That's great. Thank you for sharing. So Megan and Sylvie, you have experience giving advice um, as part of the care team to help guide conversations and opportunities to share information. What kind of advice do you provide to patients who are looking for a little bit of support? So as far as giving support to your patients, it's really important that our providers are mindful and understanding that this is traumatic news and heavy news and giving them the time and creating that space to process that with them and follow up as well. Do you want to add to that, Megan? Yeah, I think when you're in front of the doctor and they're giving you a lot of um, um, 
information, I think it's important to be available to answer questions when they get home. I mean, the doctor's throwing a lot of information at you and you kind of, okay, do you have any questions? No, out the door they go. And then you go home and you have a thousand questions or you have loved ones with a thousand questions. It's like, well, I don't know, he didn't mention that. I don't know, he didn't mention that. And having, being able to ask those questions, having an avenue to ask those questions is really important. It's funny you say that because when uh, Dan was first diagnosed, I always like to say that I got my Gray's Anatomy residency. So I would take like copious notes and I'd be like, oh, I remember this from Gray's Anatomy. Um, and <laughs> those notes actually really helped me when he was first diagnosed because that is how I was able to take the information which was so overwhelming in the appointments and turn it into a text message that went to all of our family and emails that went to our, or my school, um, because I was actually at three different schools then, um, and my girls' schools. Um, and on top of that, we were then able to take that information and post it online. And we kind of got, had the philosophy from the very beginning, even from his first appointment in the ER on February 1st, 2019, um, that the more information we shared with everyone, the easier it was for us. So that way, if we were having a bad day, they weren't thinking, oh, like, what's wrong with them? Um, we shared every piece of the journey to everyone on social media, through email, um, basically copying and pasting. Um, but everyone rallied behind us and they were able to raise money for us to make sure that we were good to go. And um, from there, our village, which is what we call it, Wilson's Village, has grown even more. And now we have our nonprofit and we constantly are sharing on there. But I think something that it really did do was it not only made it easier for us to communicate and say what was going on, but it made lung cancer less taboo and made it easier for people to talk to us about their experiences. And since then, I mean, we've made connections with so many people, but in our local community alone, I've actually had five coworkers or at least acquaintances um, reach out to us, two of which their family members were diagnosed with ALK. Um, and I think if we were not so vocal about it and putting things out there, those people would not have asked us for advice and got biomarker testing done um, and been able to get that care. So I think it really has made lung cancer, not just out, but lung cancer in general, less taboo. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, can anybody, by a show of hands in the audience, has anybody had an experience of posting on social media and can relate in terms of how you share information? Show of hands. Quite a few. Thank you. All right, so now we're going to focus the conversation on um, experiences the panel has had with disclosing or talking about diagnosis with the children in their lives, be it their kids, grandchildren, nieces, nephews. Um, and I'm going to start this one with Megan. So you talked about in your interview when you're, you know, counseling people um, that there's one clear message of hope that you want patients and care partners to convey to the children. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think kids are very perceptive. So even though you're trying to protect them, it's not always the best way. You have to be honest, no matter their age. And there's different ways to talk to kids at different age groups, I understand. But the main message is to let them know that they're going to be okay that you have a village, no matter what happens, they're gonna be okay and you're gonna make sure they're okay because that's your priority. And that just is my main message. That's such an important message to, to give children for sure, being on the receiving end, even as an adult child. Um, when my parents had to talk to me about my father's diagnosis, I think that that was the core that we were gonna be okay and that we were all there to support one another um, through laughter, through tears, through the hard times, through the, through the journey. So it becomes really important. So Brittany, you talked to us about kind of um, your and Dan's situation and balancing, wanting to protect your children 
and the kind of situation that you didn't want them to find out what was going on from other people. As Megan mentioned, children are very perceptive when something doesn't seem right. Um, talk, talk a little bit about how you and Dan strategize in, in keeping your children informed. So when Dan was diagnosed, we had a four and a half year old and a two year old. Um, so the two year old we did not have a conversation with, but the four year old is extremely hyper perceptive. So she hears everything, sees everything, and um, kind of holds on to that. So the first thing we did right away was ask the doctors, the social worker, um, how, what should we do? Like, how should we talk to her? And basically they said, just be honest. And if they ask a question about, oh, will daddy die? Don't say no, um, because you don't know and you don't want to lie to them. Um, so basically we sat her down because she was only four. Um, we said, you know, daddy has a type of sick called cancer. We tried not to avoid that word. We wanted her to know he has lung cancer. Um, we said it's a type of sick that she cannot get. Now this is pre-COVID, but basically we're like, this is not the flu, it's not a cold, you can't get it, so you'll be fine, um, but he's gonna be tired, he's gonna have appointments, um, your schedule's gonna change a little bit because Bobby or Poppy might need to pick you up from school or Grammy. Um, and she asked us a couple questions, um, but she was only four, so she doesn't really have the awareness of it, but she went to school and she was in a Catholic school um, for kindergarten. And so we told her on Sunday, on Monday, she goes in, first thing she does, she sees someone, a teacher, and just says, my daddy has lung cancer. Um, and goes to the next person, same thing. So now her school already knew because we had that open line of communication with them and we were telling everyone, um, but it was just so funny. Like they were like, well, that's typical for Frankie. She just came in and told everyone. And then at lunch, she goes up and, you know, cause she's in Catholic school. They, um, have like lunch prayers. She got up right on that microphone and was like, everyone needs to pray for my daddy. And every single day for the next three weeks, they were praying and longer. Um, but she wore that lung cancer as a badge of honor. And it really kept our perception, our perspective, like just open because she wears that as a badge of honor, truly still does. Her and her sister are both our best advocates. They come to all of our events. We keep them a part of everything. And they, especially Frankie, made it that cancer is okay. It's not a bad thing. Um, yes, it sucks, um, but it's not all bad. And if it wasn't for this and having Alf, we wouldn't have met the people that we have. And people like Summer and Lucy, they're our family. And our girls look up to Lucy and they know that they have someone. If something were to happen, they have someone else to talk to. And um, it's difficult. And there are still times that we have to talk to them um, and ask, answer questions. Um, but at least we have that openness and they understand and they're a part of it and a part of every part, so. Summer, when you told your daughter, Lucy, about your diagnosis, her reaction was, oh, sorry. Sorry, forgot about that. Um, when you told your daughter about your diagnosis, her reaction was quite different than your own. Can you just talk a little bit about that with us? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Britt. <laughs> it's so true, though, right? This is so bittersweet, this event. It's so amazing. Um, but you all are our family now. And, and, you know, we have this unspoken bond. So it just gets a little emotional. Um, anyway, yeah. So after we also, um, then my kids were 10. Lucy turned 17 within days. And Jackson was 19. Um, so we were open about it also from the beginning. They knew I had been so sick. Um, and then, of course, it's lung cancer and it's stage four, which we didn't really push with the 10 year old. Funny story, though, he did one day say, well, thank God it's stage four. It could be worse. It could be stage one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Laura Harrison, <laughs> Lucy was like, anyway, but um, so <laughs> we were all, you know, suffering and traumatized and, but our family motto from the beginning, as soon as we had Jackson and um, my husband and I always said that there are no guarantees in life. You know, you're not, when I was scared when I was pregnant with Lucy and then scared when I was pregnant with Harrison, my husband always said, Summer, it can be a typical pregnancy and you can be in a car accident. So that stayed for all of us, all five of us, the Fab Farm and Five always have lived by that motto. So after we're getting over the initial shock and trauma of the diagnosis, then, you know, I won the lottery with Alk. Um, Lucy said to me, she pulled me aside and reminded me of our family motto and said, mom, you got to keep living. You could be in an accident tomorrow. There are no guarantees in life. Like you have to live your life. And she's the one that then pushed me into art therapy, shoved me, get off your butt and get to art. She didn't say it's so nice, get to art therapy. And she knew that our family had always been involved and given back and that was therapeutic. Ironically though, as all of you sit here and listen to this, we are a little bitter to that phrase, right? That we're all walking around with uh, a bomb strapped to our chest, you know, with one foot um, in the grave, I hate to say, but we know, we know we're going to be in an accident, right? We have that hope, but we know. So recently I did share that with Lucy. I'm like, as I was preparing for this, I'm like, you know, it's funny that we talk about in our groups, how our family motto is kind of frowned upon. And Lucy, again, now years later, as a 20 year old came through with her words of wisdom and said, that might be true for all of you. And yes, that is, but that motto is what gets your family through every day. And that's what allows us all to keep living and supporting you. And so that does continue to be our motto. And she's here this weekend helping because she is so actively involved in this with me. Thanks, Lucy. It's amazing to see the support that you have in the room. It's incredible. So Amanda, you shared with us about your experience um, sharing your diagnosis with your stepson and um, how well of a job you did sharing your <laughs> diagnosis. So can you tell us a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, my stepson Jack is 11. And you know, when, when I was diagnosed, the whole family everyone knew about it. And we had just had twins also. So it was really tied up into this entire time period. So he didn't notice that like people were coming over or food was being delivered because I had just given birth. So that was tied into it. So we were able to hold off on telling him for a little bit. My diagnosis came right around, right around um, Halloween. And he happened to be out of town. He went on a science trip um, with his school that weekend. So thank God, because it was really just, you know, those, those, you know, 72 hours that we were, it was just waiting and doing things, but just really like living in a limbo of like, am I going to die or am I going to live? Um, and so we, we held off on it until the point that we really knew that we had to tell him because now we're starting to have people come over and my friend like said like, oh, so what did the doctor say? And I'm like, sure, we're going to need to, we're going to need to tell him. So, you know, we sat him down and, you know, really we're just direct with him. Our therapist had said, you know, be direct, but age appropriate. And so we did that. Um, and you know, we never talked about staging. We never talked about, um, he's like, are you going to die? And I said, we're all going to die. So, um, it wasn't, it wasn't like a imminent death type thing. By that point I had a diagnosis. I knew I was out positive and I knew that I was going to be on electinib. So, um, it was really, we had a lot more information. So we weren't just telling him and going into it like that. Um, I did tell him though, I said, you know, I'm going to have PET scans once a quarter. And so when I do the PET scans, I become radioactive. So I'm not going to be home for the day because I can't be around the kids. Um, and, and he was like, oh, okay. And so what he did was he went and made tinfoil hats for himself and the twins and was like, these are going to be our PET scan hats so that we don't get radioactive around, you know, we don't catch your radioactivity. Uh, so that was, that was super sweet. But 
um, you know, after the fact, he did compliment me and my husband in the way that we told him, but he complimented us in a comparison to how poorly of a job we did in telling him that he was going to be a big brother to having twins. So he's like, you know, you really nailed the telling me how you had cancer. That was a very good job. But, you know, whoa, the way that you told me that you were having twins, like that was, don't tell someone with a cake and a tea. <laughs> So he was really, um, he's funny. He's wiser than his years and, and we love him a lot. So he has some good humor to him also. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> um, so Sylvie, you've heard, you know, how uh, Brittany, Summer and Amanda have handled the challenge in their home. When you have somebody in your office talking about how do I, what words do I put to, um, to what's happening so my child can understand or family um, or their larger care circle. What advice do you give? Yeah, I think it's really important that we are checking in with ourselves as adults to check ourselves to see if it's our discomfort that's stopping us or making us trip up. I think as adults, we understand the concept of death and terminal diagnoses and hard diagnoses in a different way than children. Children look at it in a very black and white way. And in that way, that can work to our advantage when they're younger. The older they get, the more that they understand the abstractness of what a terminal disease can look like. So it's really important to stick with concrete words that are not open to interpretation. Like use the word death, use the word dying or will die. You wanna stay away from phrases like passed on or they're in a better place or they're in the sky. All of that can leave children thinking whatever they want to think because their imagination will think that they'll come back from the sky or they'll they're just on a trip they'll come back so you want to be really clear and concrete with your words and not be afraid that that's going to be jarring for your children i think that it's jarring for us to share that with children because we we feel that and we want to protect their innocence so badly but sharing that information does not preclude that there will no longer be any joy had. All of that can still exist with a diagnosis. And I think helping our patients and, and the adults feel empowered to live their life that way and also be clear and confident that they're doing the right thing and, and being clear with those children is really the biggest takeaway. That, that would be what I would say. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of resources that are available for families who are trying to wade through um, this part of their journey, what, what resources would you recommend? Um, There's a couple that I can think of. One is called, one is a children's book called The Invisible String, and it's a beautiful story of how no matter what happens in life, you're always going to be connected with your loved ones, even after they, they die. And another, another card game, it's called the Gift of Grace, and it's a conversation game. And each card has a different kind of question that asks about advanced care planning, your last wishes, what your preferences would be, what would your last meal want to be? So it's a really good way of having some of those other conversations with maybe older children or friends or family, just to normalize that conversation because it's it can feel taboo, but it shouldn't be because it touches so many lives. and we're all going to experience death in our life, whether it's someone that we have loved for a long time or you know, our own death at some point and other family members are going to feel that. So breaking that stigma and talking about it and talking about what you would want is really encouraged and I empower all of you to, to do those things. Meg, do you have anything that you use in the office? You know, I am more access and getting patients when they're newly diagnosed. So I don't really have a lot of these conversations. And I can tell you when I was inpatient, I saw that side and it was really just comfort and getting the patient to accept and, and being there for them during the end. Thank you so much. Um, so this is for whoever would like to jump in first. Um, what advice would you give about conversations outside of the family? So in your community, if somebody asks you a question proactively, so you've kind of done all of your social media, but you run into somebody, a family member or a family member or a coworker, because um, this conversation is hard for everybody, not just children. You know, how do you handle some of those more impromptu 
questions and situations that you run into? Usually it's with a lot of honesty, thrown in with a little humor. Um, but when it's those harder conversations or you're trying to be honest, I would say for me, the hardest thing is when you want, obviously we all want everyone to live, um, but talking about the fact that there's a possibility that someone might not. And the hardest part is that when you say something like that, like, oh, well, if something were to happen to Dan, usually the first response back is, oh, don't think like that. I'm like, well, I have to think like that because I, I still need to prepare for the future in case something does happen. And it kind of frustrates me because it's not that I'm being negative, but they view it as that. So I have no advice except being honest because sometimes I'm like, oh, well, I just, I don't know, have to be as real as possible. I can't just skirt around the issue of mortality and death. Um, it sucks, it sucks to talk about, but I don't know. Can you hear me? Oh, hello. <laughs> it is true. And I'm with Britt that, yeah, the, I'm not sure advice wise, because we all always talk about it. It's a hot topic in our support groups that or especially, but you look so great, or, and I am very positive person. I manifest lots of good things. I'm a glass half full kind of girl, and I have always been. Um, however, I also have a strong dose of reality. I have a strong, stronger dose of hope, I guess, but I'm also very realistic. But I will give a shameless plug is that these topics are all discussed in the healing arts classes. <laughs> so visit the Alpha Positive website. I have virtually nothing to add to this. It's been so hard having these type of conversations. I mean, we all know it, but it really is. And I'm very much like Summer. I'm a glass half full type person, but I'm also a realist. Like this is, you know, it's like, we're hopeful. Like I'm hopeful that this, but you know, also I don't want to just never have these type of conversations because everyone else is so uncomfortable with it. Um, and, and then when people say, how are you? I mean, I most of the time just give a real answer, but I do find that there's a very big difference between Summer saying to me, how are you? And someone, someone you know, a, a family member saying, how are you to me? Because what they're looking for is health wise most of the time, because I'm very open about the mental struggle to this. Um, Summer posted something online and it was like, this is like we all might die one day, everyone, but we walk around with a gun to our back. And so there's a different level um, to learn to live when you have that type, when you have that type of uh, situation going on. So I have, oh, yes, microphone. Um, I have one final question for Brittany. Um, when you and Dan need to, I said, take a beat and reset. Is there a song you like to listen to that's helpful to you? Yes, actually. <laughs> so wow, we so actually funny. have, I know, we actually have a family song and we call it our family song. So like anytime the girls are upset or Dan has scans and we want to celebrate or just some, we're just trying to be positive. Um, we have the song Don't Give Up On Me by um, Andy Grammer, I think it is. Dan, give me a thumbs up. Yes. Oh, I'll here we fight. go. If you guys know the song, feel free to I'll sing. Fight. Dan, you want to come up and sing with me? Can we get him a microphone? Come on, Dan. Come up here with me. Dan, come on up. Come on. I, dr I did drink a little bit too much last night, um, and we were out too late. So my voice is a little raspy, but I will... He comes up here. Come on, Dan, come sing with me. All right, at least come up here and dance with me. You guys wanna dance with me? You guys can stand up and dance. It does get a little more upbeat. Hands out in the dark and wait for yours to interlock. I'll wait for you. Come on, I'll wait for you, but you gotta get up here. I'm coming. I know. I'm not. Giving up, 
I'm not giving up, giving up, no, not yet. Sound last breath. So don't give up on I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up, giving up, no, not me. This is your, this is your spot. Your yes, <laughs> Come on. I'm not going down that easily. So don't give up on me. I will hold. I'll hold on to you. You guys gotta stand up and sing with me. No matter what my throws, can't shake me loose. Can we turn it up a little? I'll reach my hands out in the dark and wait for yours to answer like I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Come on, Lucy. I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up, giving up no night. So that will close out our panel for today. Thank you, everybody. I mean, we had to have a little fun going into the end here, but. I think we have like four minutes. If anyone oh, has a have, question. Do we have time? Wow. I know, I'm, I'm shocked. Me too. Thanks for dealing with my singing. Does anyone have any questions for us? No? You don't wanna ask where I took singing lessons? <laughs> <laughs> no one? Oh, that's okay. That's all right, yeah. I think we have about um, four minutes until. Okay. Well, thank you guys for listening. Um, we appreciate, and you guys are done. But um, we do have. I put together resources. If um, we can put the slide up, uh, you guys can scan this and some of those resources that they talked about, and some that I put together b uh, based off of caregiver recommendations and our Alk Moms group. Um, you can scan that, and you'll have all of those. And I just wanted to, again, um, recognize all of the care partners in person and virtual. Um, yesterday's video, it killed me to see the remembrance. I was moved, um, and I had seen it before, and honored to have been friends with so many people, but I also cried for my family. So um, I want to tell you how grateful we are and I've enjoyed meeting so many of you and thank you to all of those tuning in and those that couldn't be here. We couldn't get through this alone. So thank you to our care partners. <laughs>